Um, well, welcome to the North Coast Oasis Service event of uh, the spring 2024 season uh, and our second to the last event of the year. Um, uh, I would like to, uh, before I introduce today, I'll welcome you back to our next and last event of this year. Uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, Ariana True, poet laureate uh, of Washington State, uh, who will be here on uh, Tuesday, June 4th uh, for a combination of chapter reading. Uh, location TV, uh, but check back. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll be here or where it's out. It'll be accessible. So uh, we're working on it. But um, today, um, we uh, want to welcome a uh, local poet and author and zine maker from uh, Chatham, uh, Washington, Dale Davidson, uh, who has been attending lots of our events recently uh, and has made poems published, which I can't name the publications of because I don't have the title in front of me. So that would be so that would be the name. Yeah, yeah. And that is the Allison C. Literary and Arts publication. Um, and she's been featured several times, right? Uh, this week, right? Right. Second. For the second. This is coming up on the second. All right. Uh, which we published also in June. Uh, I go back to the RN True event. We'll have our um, school launch party. Um, but Dale uh, ran a very really successful uh, scene workshop earlier today, as many of you know, she was there. Um, and we're very really excited to have her read uh, her poetry here tonight. So, uh, I'd like to welcome Dale. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chris. And I'd like to start off by thanking um, Lower Columbia College and Longview Public Library and that was Voices uh, for inviting me to, um, to be a part of this, uh, this poetry reading and this day of um, workshopping zines, which was a lot of fun. Um, we, had a, we had a great time. I loved hearing what people wrote at the workshop as we kind of uh, wrapped it up today. And I uh, just, it was a delight to be among people um, being creative and expressing themselves and, and connecting with each other. So thank you again, Chris, for that opportunity. So yeah, I'm from Cal Lambert, which um, maybe, maybe you've been there, maybe you've just driven past, but it's worth stopping in. Um, I was raised by avid readers, who were also bird watchers and observers of nature. And we also had chickens and rabbits and sheep, just a little tiny farm. So I grew up around a lot of animals and observing the natural world because I didn't have a choice. <laughs> um, and I grew up in the 70s uh, when we played outside and made things and climb trees and read books. A little different, hopefully not too different now, but but I think it was a different time, um, a different way of growing up. I had a, I had teachers that encouraged me to write. And my favorite thing was to be upstairs in my room writing and drawing. And I was allowed time by my parents to daydream and be creative. They were always trying to drag me out to, you know, go do something like a hike or, you know, whatever. I don't know, it was just, it just leave me alone with my, my art supplies. Um, but that's where I started um, practicing what turns out to be zine making. I was making little illustrated stories all by myself up in my attic. And, um, feeling like I was producing something. And I had an elderly neighbor who loved writing poetry. And she discovered I wrote poetry and she took me under her wing. She was like kind of an eccentric old lady on our block. And she would invite me over for tea to read poetry together that we had both written. She would, write, she would read something she had uh, written and then I'd read something to her. And, and I can tell you, my poetry was terrible. It was really bad. But she listened. She listened and she encouraged me. And she believed that I could do it. 
And because she believed I could do it, I believed I could do it. Um, so I, I moved here in 2018 with my husband, David, when we discovered Cap Lamed. And this has been the place where I, where my poetry, my poetry has really taken off. I think it's because I've had the time and the opportunity. Like when I was a kid, I had that freedom to just explore what I want to write about. And this is such a rich region for being inspired. And any of you who do write yourselves you know that. You know that there's like an inflow supply of inspiration around here. So I've uh, been very fortunate in my my being connected to the writing community here and other poets and the generosity of some really fine poets such as um, Bob Pyle, who have you know given me their his time and his uh, his expertise and his wisdom about how to make poetry, how to make a poem better. So the poems that I brought with me tonight are mostly poems about living in this place. And before we go tonight, um, anybody who would like to take a zine with them, um, I, I brought some along. So uh, they're just up here in this little bag. And uh, when I'm when I'm finished, um, if there are any questions, uh, I think I'll just I can't I can't be poetry for a solid hour. I might inspire if I did that. So I'm going to take a Perfect. Okay. Is it my mom? <laughs> As days grow longer, look how dependably one day follows another. The moon pulling the ocean into the river, then releasing it, like a parent interrupting the upward arc of a child mid swing. Fat little fish find their way down hidden pools, leaving familiar beds to swim in the silvery euphoria of migration. Along the greening banks, soft air stirs the bees, whispering ideas of nectar and honey. Osprey and sea lion journey back to their coastal home. The river turns another page in the book authored when poetry was spoken by trees as tall as mountains. As complicated as anyone. I am juggling six blueberries before the sun can walk the hill. I am the tired surface elephant erecting and dismantling the same tent every day. I am the panhandler beneath the leaky tarp and the spotted dog beside me. I am marching to John Philip Sousa around the marriage bed with symbols while my spouse warms up on trombone. I am meat simmering in a pot, waiting for the onions and carrots. I am on the side of the fence that covets calm over spellbutt, the side that allows wild things to flourish and go to seed. I am the spent tube of carmine red lipstick, rolling down Broadway to the river. This next one, I'll give you a little uh, preface about the um, subject matter. Uh, not everybody knows, has, not everyone has heard of Darwin, what Darlingtonia plants are. So I'm just going to read you the description. Darlingtonia californica, also known as copra lily, is a carnivorous member of the pitcher plant family found along the southern Oregon coast, as well as parts of northern California. The plant can be viewed at Darlingtonia State Natural Site, which is near Florence, Oregon. The place is dedicated to the protection of this plant species. 
very unique. And my thanks to the editors at the Salon Review um, for selecting this poem for the 2023 uh, edition of the Salon Review. This is called Insect Encounters Darling Tony. Currents carry me on coastal vapors, exhale me in a boggy breath, away from swallows and salt spray. Welcome, the gilded plant whispers in tones of seduction. A vibration my vain wings answer. Temptation dances before me, the sway of a forked leaf, purplish green, waving its nectar scent, the invitation, a glossy open mouth. Translucent cells filter light as I enter, descend the chamber. Glide over intoxicants, my thorax stroked by filaments, pleasure pushing me deeper. Limpid windows promise exit, but leave nowhere. I am not the first to fall for this trick. A broth of flies and beetles beckons as the pool pulls me toward the bottom, unable to flee or fathom. How exquisite is my demise. Hmm. This is called Rain Won't Keep Me Away. Oh, and this has an after minute. Kindly raindrops land haphazardly, plop, plop, on sword burn. Shiny salal and my head. It's hardly enough to make anything wet. The soft spring rain taps a method as it falls, composing a poem on its forest typewriter. I hear jeweled words strung together like fat drops on a stem, holding vast worlds as gently as a vixen with a kit in her mouth. This is about a place um, over on the Willow Road Wildlife Refuge in Pacific County, which if you haven't been there, you, um, you might want to spend a day and go out there. It's really beautiful. This is called Tarlet Slough. Quiet places ask us in wordless language, are you listening to the evening flight of tree swallows? the outbound journey of the tide in the slough, the tall grass stirring? Are you awake to the cool air sent overland by the sea, foxglove and wild rose swaying to the summer song, the tufted sedge holding tight where water slides away toward stars and twilight? Quiet places ask us to be still to shed the ill-fitting cocoon, to wade in tidal pools and ruin our shoes. This is a poem called Seatmate, and it appears, will appear uh, later this year in a Portland um, literary journal called Palming Pigeon. What I'm struck by waiting for a Shakespeare play to begin is how the woman beside me in the dark theater, a stranger, tells me her life has been too quirky to stitch together into her books. For instance, she rescued sea lions and harbor seals in Herman County. She says she smelled bad for four years. She tells me sea lions will poop if you hose them with cold water and harbor seals will bite when your fingers get too close. That's what you do for love. You allow yourself to be covered in the stuff, to stink. She played in Beethoven on a boom box for corral pin of heads and watched them move in unison to the music. Her toenails are painted shiny black. She is 84 and wears a hearing aid. 
She entered Placido Domingo, saying at San Francisco Opera, all I can think is, I would read your book. River Garden. Whoever tied this highway in a knot was bewitched by sandy islands and braided the curves as an afterthought where the river hugs the road. I untie the knot with my eyes, loosen it with thumbs, patience, and good humor. The current creates new beaches for double crested cormorants, for sleepy stellar sea lions, for white pelicans looking to hobnob. Soon I am floating free of asphalt and yellow lines. The channel and I are plunging into the next island. This is um, a look back to childhood called the Beaded Curtain. Everything about Grandma Verna was exotic. Her shopping tube top, dangly earrings, her low, throaty laugh, the beaded curtain lighting on the track. Closed, it became a mysterious portal. Sometimes she let us pass through slowly, the smooth wooden beads rolling over our arms, brushing our faces, chattering against our legs. When she told us about her belly button stone, we asked to see it. We had never heard of such a thing. Her dressing room was through the curtain archway. She disappeared into her domain of ostrich feather hats and high heeled shoes, pulling the curtain closed behind her. We sprawled in front of the hearth amid empty Hershey kids wrappers waiting for the floor shelf. A goddess materialized behind the bustling beads, her bare brown arms reaching forward, hands pressed palm to palm, Esther Williams style, as if she were about to dive into a pool. The curtain parted dramatically, the ruby red jewel in her navel glowing like an amber. I only have one photograph of that one. Near the archway sits Grandma Burns' mother, an aging member of the Order of the Eastern Star, wearing costume jewelry and disapproval, afraid the beads might touch her. Poems flying around the Astoria Maker Bridge. This is a conversation. Where shall we rest now that the tide is high, they ask. You can't all be poems, I say. Yes, we can, say the words. Sitting on highlands, facing forgotten families, holding their wings out to dry. We are common and glamorous things. We know that. You are too messy, I point out. Look how your friends lay flattened and mangled on the bridge deck. Not everything of the air be a poem. You are not much of a poet to overlook us because we adapt and definitely on your constructions, say the words. But poems are not oily feathered things, I declare. With the bluntness, I do not feel. Have it your way, say the words. We will be poetry, whether you write us or not. <laughs> In the absence of a miracle, before you, I attended to desire and the impersonations of love as a miner in a collapsed shaft, conserving my breath and guarding the memory of the world like a fragile bubble of the wand. The world at midnight invited the snow before dawn, transformed everything it touched. I was not self-conscious, singing to myself, 
giving myself pep talks in the dark. The voices above ground dwindled to dental shavings inside a desk. A goat, a goat trap within this mountain, I found my way up, one hopeful at a time, rescuing something tougher than a diamond, making stairs out of nothing. Is it over? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wave your arms or something when I have to stop. Oh, please. Oh, please take one. Take two, actually. One to give away. Give one away. Thank you. Cedar wax wings reflected in a mirror. We all have our habits. Who's to say which are bad and which are to be admired? Consider the person who's sad and counts the minutes until they are alone to be unnoticed. Or the cat who secretly naps on the bed when no one is looking. The thing I'm driven to do has no clear purpose, so I resolve to stop. A week later, I'm back it, waiting at odd hours with words coming in my sleep, asking to be scrawled on a scrap of paper in the dark. I can't say why I do it or who it's for. I seem to have run out of meanings. <laughs> Backwater reverie. This swamped tree will give shade no more, rooted in a brackish tree, no leaves to tell its name, lush moss, masking gray bark, damp suckers sprouting from its base. The motionless water dimples, licked by English air. Children's voices float from the nearby yard, an eagle cries in the clouds. A northern flicker glides through the glade, to a tree choked by ivy. A song sparrow emerges from brush to sing his territorial song three times before moving on. Even he knows the rule of three. Sea lions provide backup vocals, discussing fishing conditions. Flowers fringed in pollen are open for business. A mason bee lands on a lawn base. If we don't blow the world apart, summer is bound to come. <laughs> Apologies for cutting this short, but it's my cat's dinner time. <laughs> How is it that a cat can materialize within the staked out territory of a person's well or life without invitation or clearance, as if the cat's mere existence is justification enough for the imposition it is about to make on one's habits and finances. How is it that an otherwise unencumbered individual of the human variety can be harnessed into servitude by a creature weighing less than a sack of potatoes? And how exactly does a person of moderate intellect learn a second language at lightning speed from a tutor who communicates through the twitch of a tail or half-witted gaze? These mysteries will remain just that. So said my cat. <laughs> the Rindle River Land. And Rindle is a, another word for small rivulets and tinier than streams, but they're the little, um, the little bits, the little strands of water that accumulate and turn into streams. That's what a Rindle is. So the Rindle River Land. An eagle fastens me to earth or possibly a swift. A dazzling rings up over the sky 
the damselfly and tiger moth. Osprey call their dusky cry from grass soft lichen nests, anchoring the evening tides with lullabies for shadowed fish. Something in me yearns to soar, no more affixed to ground, set my reflection flying high above the rindle river land. Soliferous, the air floats blue past conifers I glide, and how I dance above the marsh on wings unfolded wide. Mm -hmm. Just a few more to go. We see a lot of container ships and uh, freight uh, ships moving on our river. This is um, this is one I wrote two years ago uh, to commemorate the largest ship that at that point had ever come to the Columbia River. Um, and it was called um, Navios Night. So I left that out of the title because I think nobody knows what that means. So uh, this is called December River Traffic. We barrel down the highway to see the biggest ship to ever fly to Columbia. Neighbors are snug at their kitchen tables, reading diver news and drinking tea. But not us. We are shivering on a riverbank in Stamakaway, sand in our shoes, gritty and cold. The octopus ink sky pregnant with fiery jewels and the quarter moon spilling quicksilver over rocks, sliding ashore on each gleaming wave. Our hands are jammed deep in our pockets, icy air biting our lips. Wordlessly we wait, the night thick with frog song and magic. We squint upriver at the dark outline of Puget Island and a green line marking the channel. A faint hum quivers the water as a growing shadow swallows the landscape. Powerful engines drive a massive shape oceanward, her bow wake radiant with moonlight. She is a steel behemoth lit by a lion's belt and a shooting star. Mm -hmm. This poem is also set in uh, Pacific County in a small, small place um, at the edge of um, the Willowa Bay, uh, Toplin. And it's a very small place, but once you get there, there's nowhere else to go. So uh, this is called Toplin in March. When you get right down to it, it's all beautiful. The crow flapping past on ragged wings, the half fallen fruit tree, the clouds, gunmetal gray and titanium white, the exposed marshland made naked by an overfilled moon, the delicate window insect, the flute of a red and black bird, the wetted frame of the window frame where the will of the wind has eaten the paint. The eagle sailing over glistening mud, the bird box where lawn meets sedge, waiting for swallows to return, the rhododendron folded tight, bracing for long winter, a hawk, maybe a northern harrier, patrolling the brown, salty grass. I'm sure I'm find something. This is called If You Must Go Ahead. The glimmer of the day shines at the edges, out where the tide is turning, out where the gulls are diving. Each of us advances toward the finish, following the music, shouldering our sorrows. 
I am flying fast as darkness coming. Blacks to line my pillow, straw for midnight spinning. If you must go ahead, I'll watch the shutters. Gather up the honey, tell the bees you're leaving. Hold me gentle like a winter sweater where the moths won't find me in a box of cedar. Trade the rain warm long upon that finger. Toss it in the water. See the river dancing. Greens and blues. This is the river's spell. It slows down everything. So much to notice in a single day as the greens and blues of sky and water deepen their embrace. Last evening, a sailboat lingered in the channel, breeze filling the canvas, languorous in the arms of a spring night on tiptoe, no hurry to get anywhere, no schedule to keep, just a vessel licking the bowl clean. That was the last one. Thank you so much. And um, I don't know how we're doing for time. Is there time for a question or two? Oh, yeah. Okay. James, did you want to say something? Where do you think all I mean, there's clearly a lot of history of the local places, but where do you think your um like perspective is right? Um uh, here's the motivation, the uh how do you create your imagery? Where where does your uh, vision come from? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's the most honest answer. Um, the, the other answer is um, I, I create uh, time and quiet and solitude for myself as often as I can to hear those uh, words that might start to string together in my head that might be the beginning of a poem. And sometimes I hear that starting when I'm in the shower or something. But the, the key is when you when you do feel that there is something more um, that wants to be said to write it down. And sometimes I just write written down the first line and maybe not written anything after it for a few days. Um, the one really important piece of advice that I've gotten from a couple of excellent poets is to make the ending of the poem memorable and unexpected. And so that, that poem sticks, uh, sticks in the memory of the person who is reading it or hearing it. And, and I think that's probably the most valuable advice uh, I've received as far as making my poetry better than leaving out others. Um, <laughs> but you don't want you don't want the reader or the listener in their mind to already be filling in what that last line or that last word is going to be. You know, like they've already kind of figured out where you're going. If you take if you take a different turn, then uh, you're, you're keeping your audience, um, you're giving them a surprise. And, and, and we like surprises, generally. Mm -hmm. It's like your car breaking down on the freeway, and that's not a good surprise. But I, so, yeah, so really my, my answer is I'll have one more question. 
but but you have to create time and opportunity for it to come. So that's a great question. Anybody else? Yes, Max. Do you have any favorites from or Magnus Bogus? Um I, I really I really love the one uh, that I read for the end. Um if you must go ahead. Uh, I just I, I almost feel like that's a song. And uh I would say a piece of poetry I've written that poem probably is means the most to me. Um, and I think it resonates with anybody who is um, experiencing loss or um, the prospect of losing someone that they love. Um, there are just there are a lot of emotions that go with that. And but it's a part of life. And so that poem tries to capture, um, you know, the the longing and the that bittersweet part of, of that uh, goodbye that's either happened or about to happen. Um, but my my favorite poet, you didn't ask that, but I'll tell you, is Dennis McVincent Millay. And Mary Oliver, who actually, Mary Oliver um, was quite influenced by Ennis and Vincent Blaine. He did not know that until just recently. So um, it's very interesting to me to find that a modern poet who, um, Mary Oliver, who was, uh, I, I revere her and I and really uh, respect and admire um, her, her, her writing. That she was influenced by Edna St. Vincent Millay, you know, they could draw, you know, connect the dots to, to those two poets. Um, you know, it's, that's meaningful for me because they both were important folks in my mind. So, anything else? Yes? So, you may have answered this before, but it's like, um, what part does nature play in the modern you spend as much time as you can in nature. Can you talk about nature and how you live in nature? I mean, I do a lot of poems. Well, I was, I was stuck in Tacoma for a long time, and there is nature in Tacoma, but you have to work a little harder to get out into it and experience it. And when um, David and I moved here in 2018, um, we really just this was like a wonder again to us. We're still driving around saying, let's take that road, we haven't taken that road before. And we'll just like go on these um, impromptu expeditions, which sometimes turn out to be little adventures. But there's always something new and uh, surprising to me that I'm seeing around here. It's, I mean, I'm just, dazzled by how unspoiled so much of it is. Um, I'm really so fortunate to live where I do. We, our our uh, windows look out on the Columbia River and Puget Island, and my writing desk looks out on the river, and also the Alokamen River, which feeds into the Columbia uh, at the edge of Cat Planet. And so I have, when I'm at my desk, I have um, turkey vultures swooping by, and when they, when they fly by low and the sun is at the right angle, it'll cast a shadow over me as it goes by, and it's a big bird. And I, and I experience this momentary feeling of being like a little animal that, you know, could get caught. Not that turkey vultures care about live things, but, but it's that almost um, primitive reaction to being possibly prey. And um, and the osprey flying by, and they're back now, and they're, they're calling uh, to each other. And um, so I, I wish I, 
Um, I wish I was in better shape so that I could go out and you know see more like hiking and um and walks and things. I'm I'm just uh you know I'm not taking very good care of my body. So I, I do have to enjoy a lot of nature um from a car window or on a picnic. But there are so many beautiful places where you can easily get to, even if you're not, you know, Wonder Woman. Yeah. And, uh, and there's really, I, I think that um, I will probably die here not having explored even half of what there is to see. And um, so I, I, I feel so lucky. Well, thanks for that question. Yes. So I'll ask a question. Do um, so you mentioned sometimes you just get the first line and you write that down, and then that becomes a poem. But does everything that you write down in that early stage become poetry? And and can you talk a little bit about the process of of developing poems? Do you do you you know like journal a lot or take a lot? You know, do you have lots of things that get reduced down to poetry? Uh, a poem. I don't journal, um, but I do keep notebooks in the places where I'm apt to sit down and just have quiet time to myself. And so I have what I need at hand if something starts to percolate. And some lines of poetry will start to come and I, I, I will be able to hear that there's a rhythm, a meter there. And so that kind of dictates maybe where that poem might go. It might even have a line in it. But not everything I write down becomes a poem. I've got a lot of poems, uh, poems that I wrote two and three and four years ago, you know, in the early days here, that um, I will never see the light of day <laughs> because I was learning. I was learning to write, and nobody should have to read it or hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that's as it should be, actually. And I, but I, but you know, when I was first studying, I'm like, oh, this is, boy, this is good. You know, I thought it was good. Oh, it's good because it was something. I was doing something that I hadn't done in a long time. It just felt it just felt so good to do it, uh, and I wasn't a very good judge, or um, I wasn't very good at discerning really what was good or bad poetry. Uh, and there, I shouldn't say there's bad poetry, but I wasn't a very good judge of what made a poem sing or uh, or stick with you or speak to you. But you have to do that writing and keep doing it to get to where it starts to do those things. You have to write. You have to, you know, start out walking like a baby, or you can start walking like, you know, a grown up. And and I've and I've read. I you know one of my main things is reading widely, reading a lot of different poets. Um, it, so exposing myself to a lot of poetry that um, that I can look at and say that's why that works, and and listening to other poets read their work at poetry open mics, that is a, a huge. Um, it's like going to school if you're writing poetry, hearing other poets read what they've written, and then you start to kind of hear. Why your poetry uh, is working, and so you learn from it. We did talk about that. You you host an open mic, right? Yeah, in in Camp Lama. Does anyone know what Camp Lama is? I know my husband knows. <laughs> okay, so Camp Lama is about thirty minutes west of Longview on Highway Four. And um, there's a wonderful uh, little group pub there called River Mile 38. And 
Um, just before we can get ahead, I'm just going to try to kick off like a whole poetry weekend in South Carolina. That, of course, didn't happen. And as the pandemic um, subsided and things slowly started to, you know, come back where people were gathering together, um, I asked the uh, owners at River Mile 38 if we could do a poetry open mind. And they said, sure. And well, it was wonderful. And it was for write, any writer to come and read whatever they've been working on in a very safe, uh, welcoming atmosphere. And it was uh, so lovely that we made it a quarterly event. So uh, we meet, we do it in January, April, we just had the April one. The next one is July 25th at River Mile 38. And, um, and I post announcements about it um, on Facebook on a page called Poetry Wakayakum. And if you don't know how to spell Wakayakum, just W A H and you'll probably fill in the rest of it. <laughs> but it's, it's free, it's open for anyone. And it doesn't have to be poetry. We do have people that will read short stories and and now their kitchen is open. It isn't just the roof up part, but now the kitchen is open and they make a killer tiramisu, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> which is like, I don't know, it's like a quart of whipped cream and just one serving. It's really, go just for that. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes? Are uh, they? When you say they're all short stories, they seem to be all very short stories. Is there, is there an inspiration why I have this? I think that is a very interesting observation. It's true. My phrases are of a, you know, not too long length. And it, it's because of my own personal preference for reading poetry that does not have super long lines, almost like a, uh, almost like prose. Um, and I'm also put off by poems that are extremely long and wordy. I feel like you should be able to say what you're trying to say in a, in a decent amount of time where the reader doesn't, you know, start to be on or you know, start to look and see how many more pages is this, you know. I, I want to read a poem and, uh, and enjoy it in a reasonable amount of time. And so I, I write my poems that way. I mean, yeah, I love it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Did, did you have an online person? Yeah, but I have no question. Okay. That, but that's why I was back. Okay. Well, you've been so kind tonight, and uh, I appreciate you coming out and, and listening to poetry. And I hope you feel encouraged to write your own poetry or just to write something. It doesn't have to be poetry. Looking at you, Tim, Machine. So, um, Anyway, this, this has been just a delight to spend time uh, with Northwest Voices and Longview Public Library and the Lower Columbia College. Thank you. I, I forgot we should uh, thank the Friends of the Longview Public oh, Library yes. thank for, you, for the funding. Friends of the Longview Public Library. Um, I always forget. Yeah. They, so I don't work with them directly. They, <laughs> they also contributed to the success of the yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. And I do hope to have a poetry collection out in the world within the next couple of years of some uh, publishers besides that my manuscript um, is worthy. So, thank you so much, Dick. Thank, thank you so very much. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, and, and you come up and get a, a Z if you like. Thank you.